Good afternoon, Slumstead community. My name is Morelia Morel Diaz, and I'm the president of the newly found Salem State Sagnus chapter. <laughs> I have the honor of introducing Dr. Micaela Martinez. Dr. Micaela is a proud Chicana ecologist and justice advocate. Dr. Martinez is the director of environmental health at We Act for Environmental Justice in New York City where she's responsible for advancing efforts to improve environmental health in communities of color, low-income communities by conducting research, promoting public health awareness, education, and advocacy. Dr. Martinez earned her PhD in Ecology and Evolution at the University of Michigan and completed her postdoctoral training at Princeton University. Previously serving as the assistant professor at Columbia University, Melman School of Public Health, and Emory University. From 2017 to 2023, Dr. Martinez was, was supported by the prestigious NHI Director's Early Independence Award. Her research has focused on infectious diseases, ecology, social justice, climate change, infant health, and environmental impacts on health. Her work has been featured. Um, Dr. Martinez has also worked with various environmental health committees to advocate for social justice and environmental health. Dr. Martinez is currently leading the We Act Beer Inside Out campaign, and she is on the advisory board committee for the Black Beauty Project. Both projects seek to address the problem of toxic chemicals in beauty products, particularly those that enforce eurocentric beer standards and are marketed towards women of color. Her talk today will be discussing how structural racism impacts environmental exposures and health in the United States, and how we can center uh, social justice to address climate change and other environmental crises. On that note, I'll pass it off to Dr. Martinez. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Thank you for having me and for that very kind introduction. I appreciate it. This is actually my second time getting to visit Salem State. I um, got to speak at the Darwin Festival back in 2020, and I was delighted to see that I was getting reinvited. And this campus is very heartwarming to me because it reminds me a lot of my undergrad campus, which was the University of Alaska Southeast. And I'd really just, um, I love the environment of you know, more intimate undergrad settings where you have faculty who know, the, know their students very well. I just find it to be very enriching and I'm happy that I had that kind of undergrad experience. And so today I wanted to talk about some of the work that I've been doing um, since I've um, started working with We Act for Environmental Justice. So as Marilia mentioned, I used to be an academic scientist and then quite recently, and also for all of the young people in the room, um, sometimes you never know where your career is going to take you. If you would ask me two years ago if I would ever leave academia and be working for a nonprofit organization, I would have been like, no way, I could never even imagine such a thing. Um, but life takes its turns, and I had this um, opportunity to come and help expand out the research program for an environmental justice organization right at the time where my lab was really trying to expand their work on environmental justice and I've made this um, transition and it's just been uh, such an amazing experience. So just want to talk to you a little bit about the work that I've been doing at We Act for Environmental Justice. And first, before we can start talking about environmental justice, we kind of have to build up to understanding what justice is. And I really love this um, illustration that's based off the, the giving tree. So you see this tree here, and you see the two children that are standing under the tree. And the child to the left has more access to the fruit on that tree. That tree is leaning over in that child's direction. There's more fruit growing on that side of the tree. So you have one child who has this opportunity to get the fruit, and then the other child who is not having that same opportunity. So this is what we call inequality. So there is unequal access um, to a resource. And then, when we talk about equality, um, equality, at using this example, would be if we recognize, well, these children need to have access to this tree, so let's give them a tool to, uh, uh, to increase, allow them to increase their access, but we give them the same tool. So in this case, you give them the same height ladder, which, yes, that increases the access, but it doesn't 
uh, fix the inequality because now the child on the left is easily able to grab the apple, it doesn't have to wait for it to drop, but then the child on the right still has that unequal access even though they've been giving that, given that tool. And then now this takes us to equity. And especially on college campuses, we hear a lot about diversity, equity, and inclusion. When we talk about equity, then the equity framing says, okay, well you acknowledge the fact that there was unequal access, and you make your tools to try to address the fact that there was unequal access. So now in this case, and if there was equity, we would give the child on the right a taller ladder acknowledging that they have to reach higher for that apple. So that starts to fix the problem, but if you notice, this tree is still bending over to the left, and there's still more fruit growing on the left. So even if you have an, an equity kind of framework and are adjusting your tools, it still hasn't fixed the root of the problem. And that's where justice comes in. So justice is really focused on the broken system. So in this case, if we were to have a justice framing, then we would say, well, that tree is bent over. The fruit is unequally distributed. So let's actually do some work on fixing that tree. And so now you see in this case where that tree has been fixed, and now you see the, that inequality has been addressed, but not by um, giving, using tools in terms of the different ladders, but actually trying to fix the root cause. And so to be able to understand environmental justice and actually just social justice in general, we really have to think about structural racism because structural racism is that broken tree. It's that broken system. And so the definition of structural racism that I like to use um, is the totality of ways in which societies foster racial, racial discrimination via mutually reinforcing and equitable systems. And I underline that part that says mutually reinforcing inequitable systems. And the, the, importantly, and especially for any of you who have taken ecology classes, how many of you have taken an ecology class? Raise your hand. Okay, many of you. So in ecology, we're used to thinking about how, let's say, organisms or um, different aspects of ecosystems influence one another. And sometimes those influences are in non-linear, non-additive, not simple ways, but you can kind of have roundabout ways that different species can influence each other, or different components of an ecosystem, and you can have systems that are enforcing each other. So now kind of take those concept that you, concepts you've learned in biology and think about social systems, how they can actually be impacting one another. And so now I've included some of those here. So community disinvestment. Community disinvestment is if you have, let's say, a city governance or a federal government that will invest more in one area and not invest in another, so that one place has been disinvested in. Um, differences in uh, the criminal legal system depending on um, race and ethnicity and um, poverty. So you have over-policing of communities of color and low-income communities in the United States. You have um, bad and now hopefully illegal lending practices from banks that can discriminate against people of color in terms of home loans and can has helped generate this home um, ownership gap. So you can think about all these different ways that racism can come into play in society, whether that's through healthcare, policing, housing, education, but none of those things are operating by themselves. It's like an ecosystem where they can reinforce each other, whether directly or indirectly. And so now, so that's what thinking about structural racism as a whole, but environmental racism is an aspect of structural racism that's really manifesting through our environment. And just to give you an, a couple examples of environmental racism in the United States, and you know, we could spend all day coming up with examples both here in the US and also internationally, um, but people of color in the United States are 61% more likely to live in a county with at least one failing grade for air pollutant. So the EPA set standards to say what 
the levels of air pollutant that air pollutants that are acceptable and if you're a person of color you're more likely to live in a place that is going to have bad air and then one of the most um, kind of shocking statistics and most some of the most shocking statistics often come from <coughs> asthma um, childhood asthma particularly and so as of 2020 black children are 7.6 times more likely um, to die of asthma compared to white children where I live in Harlem which is the upper um, part of Manhattan in New York a predominantly black community we have childhood asthma hospitalizations that are over 20 times higher compared to the white affluent neighborhoods that are you know just a mile away from us in lower Manhattan. So you see these really stark disparities when it comes to health. And a lot of these things have to do with the differences in the environments that we live in. And one thing when um, you start talking about environmental racism, uh, people will often think, well, doesn't this have to do with poverty? People of color in the United States um, tend to have lower income compared to white communities. That's because of pay gaps. That's because of all kinds of racist practice in education and um, labor and workforce development, et cetera. But there have been a number of studies to date, and it's very consistently been found in the scientific literature, that even if you look at environmental conditions and compare black and Latino communities with white communities in the United States, even if you control for income, like income differences, you still see that communities of color are not experiencing the same environments as their white counterparts that are economically matched to them. So if you're a black or Latino person in the United States, and there's even more and more research on this also expanding to other communities, Arab communities, AAPI communities, in general, communities of color, even if you make the same amount as a person in a white community, your environment that you experience will tend to be more degraded and more unhealthy. And so I mentioned to you about childhood asthma. And some of the work that we've been doing in New York is really to look at and quantify, well, what are the actual um, differences in terms of the rates of um, various health outcomes across communities when you look based on um, race and ethnicity? Because currently in the scientific literature, usually what you'll see are data like um, let's say for asthma, you would compare, well, here's the prevalence of asthma among black, Latino Americans, white Americans, and you can just see the differences in rates. But one thing as an ecologist, and I think many of you can appreciate, is that it's also really to look at things spatially and how things play out um, over space and across communities. And we're really used to doing this among like animal and plant communities, um, but more and more trying to apply these kinds of ideas to also human health. So what I plotted here on this x-axis is I've taken every neighborhood in New York City and I've um, plotted them based on the percent of that community that's non-white. So essentially the percent of people of color in that community. So if you're here at um, 20, then that means that this is an 80% white community, 20% people of color. And then as you go all the way over here to 100, these are communities that we have in New York City that are over 90%, close to 100% black and Latino, predominantly. And then on the y-axis, what I'm showing is the childhood asthma emergency room visits. And this is also taking into account the number of children. And so what you see as you move from the predominantly white communities to the um, predominantly communities of color, you have an exponentially higher rate of childhood asthma ER visits. And there's some points in there that are in black and some that are in red. Those are just showing two different years, 2018 and 2022. Um, there had been a thought for a couple of years that um, maybe the pandemic was going to kind of solve some of the childhood asthma issues, um, but it definitely did not. So we see this pattern is still holding up. And one thing that's really important to know is these health outcomes that we can see um, that are related to racial demographics, 
This plays out all across the lifespan. So what I've done is I've plotted other health outcomes and um, kind of put them on a timeline based on life stage. So what I have here on the left is the infant mortality rate, and you can see that significant increase when you, uh, with significant increase in infant mortality in communities of color. I have childhood obesity, where you have higher rates in communities of color, diabetes, and then premature mortality. So what this is to show you is that no matter if it's from birth all the way to death, that we have these disparities in health outcomes, and that these disparities for all of the diseases that I've shown you um, so far, these are all health outcomes that are highly influenced by the environment that we live in. When we're talking about asthma, um, childhood asthma is highly affected by exposure to pests. So if you have like mice or cockroaches in the house, exposure to mold, so for homes that have water damage and mold, exposure to air pollutants both inside the home if you have a um, gas burning stove in your home that releases air pollutants or you live in a neighborhood that has high outdoor air pollutants because of trucking traffic. All those things come together and they are driving these, um, these very high rates. And so when I think of health disparities such as the ones that I've shown you, the way that I really like to conceptualize them is thinking about an oil rig. So here's a picture or illustration of an oil rig. And so an oil rig, if you look over at an ocean and you see where they're drilling for oil, all you're gonna see is like the rig at the top. And what you don't see, and it's like this very ugly man-made thing, right? But what you don't see is underneath the ocean, there's all this infrastructure for doing that drilling and extraction. And so this is how I think about these health disparities. We see at the top, these man-made health disparities like these extreme rates of childhood asthma and premature mortality, but what's actually under the surface and driving those is that environmental racism and those disparities and the differences in our environmental quality. But just like an oil rig, I think it's really important to note that these are man-made things and so the differences in our environmental quality that is something that is man-made it's constructed constructed by our societies and our policy so therefore that means it's something that can be addressed right and i'm actually going to skip through that slide because i feel like it would take me a little too long to get through but so two of the things that i wanted to talk about today that i've been working at in my new position at we act is how we're addressing um, racism in the beauty industry and then also some work we're doing around um, community air monitoring and trying to help address some of the issues with air pollution that we have. So let's get into it. Okay, so beauty justice. And the name of the campaign that I run is called the Beauty Inside Out campaign. And if any of you are interested, we have like publicly open meetings once a month that over Zoom, which you're all welcome to join. And so when it comes to um, beauty justice, so beauty justice is really addressing two health harms that are done by the beauty industry. One is like physical, biological harm to our health that happens from exposure to toxic chemicals that are in beauty products, which is very rampant in the United States because we have very little federal regulation over the use of toxic chemicals in cosmetics and beauty products. So um, when I talk about beauty products, I'm also referring to personal care products. So things like soap, lotion, shampoo, um, hair conditioner, there is very rampant and widespread use of toxic chemicals um, in all these product classes. And then when it comes to racism in the beauty industry, the beauty industry in the United States, and I would say actually just globally, has really been embedded in Eurocentric white-based beauty standards. And there are a lot of white supremacist ideas that are very deeply embedded within the beauty industry. And I'm gonna talk about a couple of those um, that we're working on. So when you have um, racialized and racist within beauty and beauty norms, that does psychological and societal health harms to us, whether we are aware of it or not. And a lot of this is through targeted marketing and advertising. 
And so the way that we're trying to address this problem um, at WE Act and as part of the Beauty Inside Out campaign is we have two approaches. We have a top-down approach where we're working with regulators to try to improve policies. Um, I've been working on this both at the level, the international level with the United Nations, federally trying to get bills passed in Congress, and then locally uh, in New York State. And then we have a bottom-up approach as well, which is really trying to foster social movements and awareness of this issue so that we can start to address the, these beauty norms and put pressure on companies. And so when it comes to the racism and white supremacy within the beauty industry, two of um, the most striking examples of this come from skin lightening products and also chemical hair straighteners. And so skin lightening products, even though we don't talk about them all, of the, all that often, it is a bit like publicly, it's not something that you know, you see a lot of advertisements for on the television in the United States or on social media, but it's a really, really big industry here and also globally. And so um, skin lightening products are really based in this idea that having white skin or lighter skin is preferable, whether for beauty reasons or for um, more like societal reasons in terms of um, class, class structure and such. And then when it comes to chemical hair straighteners, um, chemical hair straighteners, you know, the existence of this as a beauty product is really a, also based in racism because hair straighteners have been marketed to women of color for decades and decades and decades to try to promote this idea that having straighter hair is preferable or more beautiful. But the, so that's like the societal kind of piece of it. But the other side of this is both of these product types have some of the most dangerous chemicals that are even present in beauty products. So in um, skin lightening products, and I'll show you some data that we have on this, skin lightening products um, tend to have mercury in them. So mercury is a really dangerous neurotoxin that is actually illegal by international treaty, by federal law, by state law, but companies continue to put mercury in skin lighteners because it makes them work really well. Mercury, when it's applied to your skin, will prevent your skin cells from producing melanin, which is that pigment that gives us a darker skin tone. So if a person is regularly applying mercury to their skin, they actually will have lighter skin and will result in a, a skin bleaching. And then when it comes to hair straighteners, hair straighteners tend to have a really high level of formaldehyde. How many of you have ever heard of formaldehyde? Most of us probably have. Yes, it's the same chemical that's used in embalming fluid. It's like really nasty. Um, it's a known human carcinogen. It also is known to have reproductive health harms, like um, exposure to preg women, pregnant women being exposed can cause um, spontaneous miscarriages, birth defects. Formaldehyde is a really nasty chemical and also can increase your risk of uterine cancer. And so the long and the short is these products are everywhere, especially if you live in a community of color in the United States like I do. Here, this picture, um, here in this corner, I took this picture. This is a beauty supply store just three blocks from my home in Harlem. And what you see in the front window, I took this from outside the store. In the front window is three full shelves of skin liners. So these are like hidden in plain sight. Um, if you go to New York City, I'm sure if you go to any of the um, communities of color in Boston and go even look at like your Rite Aid or CVS, you're also likely to find them at major chains too. And then if you just um, Google, or not Google, do an Amazon search, I just did a screen cap from Amazon, hair relaxers, this is what you'll get at the top. One thing I really want you to take away from this um, photo of hair relaxers is all of the models in these photos and these covers of the boxes are all women of color. So what this is showing you is that these products are being marketed directly to women of color and these products are very dangerous. And one other very disturbing thing when it comes to hair relaxers, there are whole hair relaxer um, brands and companies that are targeted to children. 
And so this is a very um, problematic product type. So these things are everywhere. And then we know that they're everywhere, but we didn't really have a sense of how often people use these products. So before I had come to um, we Act, we Act this did a survey about a year and a half ago of 297 women and femme identifying individuals in northern Manhattan to ask them, do they use these products? Because we see that they're around on the stores, but what's the actually frequency or prevalence of use? And um, the 297 individuals that were enrolled in this study were all people of color. And what was found was that 25% of all the survey respondents had used skin lighteners at some point in their life. And when it come, came to AAPI respondents, it was as high as 57%. So that means that skin lighteners are being used, or being used in our community. And then when it came to hair straighteners, 44% reported using hair straighteners. And when it came to black respondents, it was as high as 60%. So again, these products are available and they're being used. And we know they're dangerous. And now thinking back to, or going back to the societal pressures and the embedded racism that exists within these products, um, one really important thing and maybe unexpected thing that came out of the survey was the individuals who reported using skin lighteners and hair straighteners were also asked about their motivation to use them. And what was found overwhelmingly is people reported that they use these products not because it, they thought having straighter hair or lighter skin made them more beautiful or more desirable or professional, but they reported that they use these products because they felt that it made other people think that they were more beautiful, desirable, or professional. And so that really goes to show how social norms around beauty can influence people's product use and actually people's health because it's dictating whether or not they're getting exposed to these harmful chemicals. I'm gonna skip that slide. And so some work that I've been doing with one of my um, undergraduate research assistants, Tammy Deng, who's based at Emory University, is we really wanted to get at um, how prevalent mercury was or how prevalent mercury is in skin lighteners. And the thing about mercury and skin lighteners, so mercury is just so dangerous. It's like such a dangerous chemical. I remember when I was in middle school that there was a girl in my reading class that had a mercury necklace and it broke in class. And our whole school had to get evacuated and the hazmat team had to go in. So you can think about such a dangerous neurotoxin, but is actually just getting put in beauty products that are sold on the shelves, like in our regular stores. So um, with mercury, it, a skin lightener, whether it's a cream, soap, um, it could even be a skin lightener that you don't know is a skin lightener, things that are advertised as like, uh, an underarm soap that will make your underarms lighter or a skin evening product that's going to get rid of freckles. Skin lighteners come in lots of different uh, marketing types, but we wanted to know how common mercury was in them because they will never say it on the label because it's illegal, but we knew that it was present. So what we did is we contacted groups from around the world, but we also tried to focus on the United States groups that we knew had been doing lab-based testing of skin lighteners to see if we could actually get data on what creams and soaps were being tested and actually the levels of mercury so we could create a big database. So we've been working with four groups and that includes an international nonprofit, California Department of Health, Minnesota Department of Pollution Control, and the New York City Department of Health. And now we've been able to amass close to 2,000 um, lab tested samples um, of skin lightening products. And what we found is that of those 1,966, 47% of them have contained mercury. These are not like completely random samples. These groups that have gone out to sample, they tend to try to prioritize samples that they think will actually have mercury in them. So those that might have more suspicious labeling or be from countries that we know tend to manufacture using mercury. Um, but the really stark thing is, 
So when we look at mercury and skin lighteners, there had previously been a threshold that was like the threshold for kind of contamination or unintended mercury and skin lighteners, which would be one part per million. So one part per million was kind of like that safety threshold that of mercury um, in skin lighteners. But in the products that we have, we have some products that have a, as high as 210,000 parts per million of mercury. So these are really extremely high levels. And just here on this plot, I'm just showing the year which the sample is collected. We have almost 20 years of data. And then on the y-axis, the um, amount of mercury in parts per million. So you can see there are some really, really light, high levels here with many of them being over 50,000 parts per million. So these are at the level that they're so toxic that if a person, and we've seen this from some of these samples, that if a person were to bring it into their home and open one of these jars and be using them, that their children or other inhabitants in the house could get poisoned from the vapors coming off these products, which we've seen happen quite a bit in California. And then we've been looking to see, well, where, what countries are these products being manufactured and shipped to the United States? We see that Pakistan is the um, country where 284 of the 600 or so products um, has come from. So we have certain countries that we see that they're manufacturing more of these illegal products than others. But you can even see there's some products manufactured here in the United States um, and other places like the United Kingdom and France. And so this is really going to, showing that this is a worldwide problem and something that even if we were to address it here in the US, that wouldn't completely solve this problem. We really have to take an international approach, which is why we've been working with the United Nations uh, Minamata Convention of Mercury on this. And I just wanted to check the time because I wanted to see where I'm at, how many more minutes I have. Ms. Um, Ryan? You got another, another 10. Okay, sounds good. Great. So then with all of this, uh, because I wanted to wrap up the beauty justice up, with this beauty justice work um, on mercury, we're also doing work on formaldehyde and personal care products in general, so like toxic chemicals across product types. But I think what this skin lightening story really is showing you is a couple things. That first of all, we can be exposed to highly, highly toxic chemicals from beauty products, things that you would assume are safe, things you would never even think twice about them harming your health. So this is an industry that, in terms of like public health professionals and also ecologists, because mercury is a problem for people, it's a problem um, in wild ecosystems, we really have to take coordinated efforts to deal with these toxic chemicals and these big industries that are perpetuating the use of these chemicals. The mercury in skin light in her story also really goes to show you this disproportionate burden that is placed on women of color when it comes to these toxic hazards. And really that thinking back to that giving tree example, all of us are exposed to toxic chemicals from our beauty and personal care products, but there it's the exposure because of the way that the system is set up is a very um, unequal in terms of this burden and women of color tend to be very highly burdened by toxins because of these um, racialized norms and then just these harmful practices of these companies. So that's something that in environmental justice we're really um, seeking to address. Were there any questions? Or we should wait to the end. I have a, que a question in the back. Yeah, we actually have all the names. And so that's something that we're going to be putting out. So we're um, going to be making a public platform. We're hoping to do this by this June to be able to show the names. We have pictures of all of the boxes so that people can actually see um, which products. Because some of these products, like, they're everywhere. Like, you can even find some of these products on Walmart's online website. Like, so, you know, it's something that we're really trying to raise um, public awareness about. And then, so that was the beauty justice piece of it. And now I wanted to move into talking a little bit about air pollution. And this is really 
to try to give you a sense for how research is done when it comes to community-based organizations. Because unlike research in an academic setting, where we oftentimes, you know, as an individual scientist, you have your research interests and your research agenda, and you can plan and execute those projects out over a long time horizon. You know, you're like, oh, over the next five years, I want to study A, B, and C, and you plan out your grants and, and kind of carry that all out. But doing research in the justice space, it really is more of a reactive and also like policy driven research because you might have a research plan for something interesting you wanna do, but then something might pop up and you have to address that and design a research program around this new issue. So to give you an example of this is congestion pricing in New York which I just heard that on the news today, this is something Boston is also considering. So also locally applicable. So congestion pricing, this is something that's been used in countries around the world. I think Singapore was maybe the first. London has had this for, I think, a couple decades now. But the idea is, is if you want to reduce car traffic, if you want to reduce air pollution, um, noise burden, or noise pollution, I should say, in a particular area that's overburdened by traffic, then what you can do is you can charge people a high rate to drive in that area to try to reduce the demand for driving there and reduce the congestion. So here, this map here is a map of New York City, but this island in the middle, this is Manhattan. And the bottom of Manhattan is like, that's where Times Square is, that's where the financial district is. This is like a very high tra traffic vehicular area. So what the city has um, proposed, and they're gonna start this spring, is to charge people really high rates to drive there. So for most of this area, it's gonna be like $23 for a car to drive there. So every day that a car goes into that area, they're gonna have to pay 23 bucks. If they leave and then come back, they're gonna have to pay another $23. So the idea for the city to do this was they said, okay, well this will reduce traffic and air pollution, but also raise a lot of money for us to then revamp our subway system to try to get the city to be more climate resilient and mitigate um, fossil fuel use by having less cars on the road, having better transportation infrastructure, which all sounds amazing. And if it works well, that will be amazing. But one problem with this is that the way that uh, Manhattan is structured is essentially there's a gradient, a racial gradient in Manhattan. So lower Manhattan is predominantly white and more affluent neighborhoods, more expensive housing and such. And as you move farther north, then the neighborhoods become predominantly black and Latino and lower income. So one of the concerns now is that since all of these vehicles are gonna stop driving in lower Manhattan, but people still wanna get down to that area, that this is gonna reroute traffic so that the burden of all of that vehicular traffic is just gonna move further north and then fall upon the communities of color that are already overburdened um, by the city's pollution. So what we decided to do, and this is Jaron Burke, he's our environmental health manager who's on my team, <coughs> was to come up with a community air monitoring project where we would enroll community members from all over Upper Manhattan, so in our predominantly black and Latino neighborhoods, and provide people with air monitors that they can deploy outside of their home or in their neighborhoods, and then also um, give them data analysis training so that we could fill a big data gap and monitor the air as, it, as this congestion pricing is rolled out, but have data that is community owned. So that means if a person has one of these air monitors, they have their data, they know how to download it, they know how to analyze it, they can go to city council if they want. They can write our governor's office and say, look, this is what my air looked like before this policy, this is what it looked like after this policy. So. This is one way that you can get community members actively involved. This is what this platform looks like. It's these sensors are called purple air sensors and they measure particulate matter. But they have a nice platform where any person that anybody actually even, it's completely open to the public. Like you can go and look at these data. Um, and then the individuals that own the sensors that we're giving to the community members 
they um, can download like the full data, but any citizen can go and download like snapshots of the data. But you can see it's like pretty user friendly. It will tell you what the current air quality index is. And then when you go to download the data, it will tell you um, the level of particulate matter in the air. Cool, and I'm actually gonna skip. The, well, this is just to show you. We've deployed 10 of them so far, and so this, these are data from three of our monitors, but they're very high resolution data, so like every 30 minutes. Um, and so we'll, our community members will be able to see the quality of the air before and after congestion pricing. And then just lastly, I wanted to say, um, we're starting to expand the types of things that we measure in the air. So when it comes to air pollution, researchers oftentimes measure uh, PM 2.5, which stands for particulate matter 2.5, which is little particles that are 2.5 micrograms in size or smaller. So they're so small that when you breathe the air, that those particles can actually, once they're in your lungs, escape from your lungs and get into your blood vessels and then get into your circulation. So this is why it's really bad for heart health, for cardiovascular disease, because you literally are getting air pollutants like into your bloodstream. So these um, air monitors measure that particulate matter 2.5, but we also just got a grant to even get better air monitors that not only measure those par particulate matter, but also measure different gases like ozone, uh, carbon monoxide, nitrogen dioxide, so these other gases that have other health harms in our body. And I'm not gonna jump into the health harms, I'm gonna skip through that, um, but the last thing I just wanted to say, um, just going back to like this justice framework, is that so we have when issues arise like the congestion pricing that we don't know what the impact on our community is going to be then we have to respond research wise and like start collecting data but one of the things that is also really important is advocacy like what are we going to do with those data how are they going to be used to improve the lives of people because going back to the justice component of it so for instance when we have um, community members now being able to do this air monitoring, then you know, one thing that we can plan since now is like how are these data going to be used to kind of hold the feet of policymakers to the flames? Because when New York City did the ecological and environmental analysis of this congestion pricing plan, they made claims like we're setting aside millions of dollars for more roadside vegetation and put air filtration units in schools that are overburdened by air pollution. But oftentimes, to get those kinds of resources, you have to be able to like really push on policymakers to make those things happen. So this is why now from the start, we're preparing, we're anticipating, we're gonna test our hypothesis that there's gonna be more air pollution uptown because of this policy downtown, and then we will already have in hand different things that we wanna advocate for to help mitigate this issue. So that's really how um, kind of the different, some of the key differences between how nonprofit and justice um, research works compared to academic research. And it's all very important. Both sides are important and they feed into one another because we wouldn't know what air sensors to put out and how which gases are impacting health if there hadn't already been the academic science there for us to lean on. Um, so both are important, but this is how we use data for advocacy. And that's it. Lastly, for any of you that are interested, I know, um, for, especially for the students that are, you know, that are interested in environmental justice, you can become part of WEAC for Environmental Justice. You don't have to live in New York City. Um, we, have, we work all over the country, um, but if you sign up as a member, I think it's something like a membership fee of $20 a year. We have like working groups on climate justice. We have um, days of the year where we take our members to do advocacy, um, like lobbying in DC to talk to um, the Senate. We do a lot of really fun things, but we also do a lot of like really hardcore advocacy that our members are able to be a part of. EJ benefits from a geographic analysis like the GIS and the VIAC. 
you probably have someone doing GIS with you or yeah. contracted out or something? Yeah, absolutely. So we actually have a really great um, geographer in our DC office who actually came, he just finished his PhD in like snow hydrology. So he was a, um, a snow hydrologist and you know has all of these great mapping skills that now he's applying to environmental justice. So when it comes to GIS, the types of things that are really important, especially at this time, is the US federal government has now started to define environmental justice communities as a way of determining fund allocation to counties around the United States. So this has actually led to like a huge kind of battle among geographers of like how do you, what are the right variables to use to determine whether a community is an environmental justice community. So if you want to know is a community overburdened by pollution, you know, you have to look at the air, you have to look at the soil, you have to look at what plants are there that might be giving out pollutants and sometimes you have to be really creative with the types of data using like NASA satellite data for um, seeing like smokestacks and the, the work, the geographer's kind of role in environmental justice is really big and yeah, that's something for any of these students that are doing GIS work, that's a big open area. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So do you feel free to ask Dr. Martinez questions and actually while I walk to the front, I forgot to announce the Student Bio Society are selling their new t-shirts. Oh, cool. Um, so if you go to the back, unfortunately today just cash, old hard cash, 15 <laughs> bucks buys you a new uh, t-shirt. It also happens that I'm the only one on the mic today, my colleague uh, Dr. Carr is ill, so any questions? You want, oh, Nelson's going to help out. Oh, we have a question in the front. I can pass you the mic. Um, I don't know if you touched on this, but how did you kind of like fall into like the nonprofit and like getting into something like that? Like, how did you find that? I guess. <laughs> Yeah, so if I'm to be perfectly honest, so my lab after um, COVID hit, because I'm infectious disease ecologist by training, and so my lab started responding to the pandemic, and one of the things that we saw right away is that Black and Latino Americans were dying at a disproportionately high rate. And within the um, infectious disease ecology community, like none of us were conversant on health disparities and structural racism because that had not been a um, major factor in infectious diseases until you know very recently. And so then I started doing work on structural racism, but I honestly found that um, it's kind of difficult to do that kind of work within academia. And I had applied for a grant to use ecological food web, essentially networks, and apply them to um, st the study of structural racism. And I told myself, if I cannot find support within the academic setting to take these ecological tools, and apply them to studying racism, then I know that I actually need to go to a different space and to go to the nonprofit and be embedded in the justice space to do that research. And that's what happened. I, I like applied for multiple grants to get support for this, and I was just finding it just was not it was not very widely like kind of embraced within academia. So then I was like, okay, here's my sign. And at the same time, we act was looking for a new environmental health director. So it ended up being a really great fit. But I think all that is to say, like I was mentioning earlier, you don't know where your research is going to take you. And sometimes you have to go to the places where you will find support for your ideas. And it might not always be your comfort zone. And so you might have to switch up. Hi, um, thank you for the speech, it was really, really good. Um, I did want to ask because San Juan State as a school is very advocate for sustainability within campus as well as supporting the POC groups within our community. But I want to ask like, from your point of view to the outside of the world, what we as individuals, as students, can also do to further support our POC groups. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, and that's really a great question. So one thing is when it comes to structural racism, 
it's something that still a lot of society is just even learning to be comfortable with like talking about. I don't know if you noticed during my talk, but I very intentionally use the word white supremacy a few times. That's a word that a lot of people are really uncomfortable with. But in reality, for us to be able to actually move forward as a society, we have to acknowledge the harms that have been done and start to normalize the conversa these hard conversations. So honestly, it can be as easy, like supporting POC communities can be as easy as like in casual conversation, acknowledging that like something is white supremacist or like that a system is very intentionally set up to harm some people and then lift others. And that's why like social movements are so important because if you think of things like the civil rights movement um, or even you know now with the climate movement that like these, you often think like, oh, these are these really huge things that like me as an individual might not be able to contribute to, but these big movements always start with individuals like in their local front line like dealing with the issue and when it comes to things like climate change when it comes to things like racism it really starts at home and the social the amazing thing about social movements is like uh, you, just like an epidemic can spread social norms can spread like information spreads through social networks very widely so even just like what you normalize here on campus will impact Salem, will impact then, you know, like it spreads. And I think that that's a really powerful thing. Yep. Oh yeah, who, who can get to you first? <clears throat> so I have a question about testing on the products that we use. So like you walk in the Target, there's a bunch of beauty products, hair, whatever it is. Um, is there any actual testing that happens on these products that we use? No, so, yeah, so there is not. So one of the big misconceptions in the United States, so there was recently a, a research study by the Lake Research Group, which does like these massive um, studies of like American polling for various things um, in the United States. And one thing that they found in a study in 2022 was that like 75% of Americans are under the impression that products are tested for safety before they land on the store shelves. But that's just absolutely not the case. Um, in the United States, when it comes to cosmetics and personal care products, the federal government, uh, the arm of the federal government that regulates that is the Food and Drug Administration. In uh, 2022, they updated their regulations for cosmetics and personal care products for the first time in 78 years. And in fact, they rolled back a lot of the safety standards. So to give you an example of how bad and lax the federal regulations are, it wasn't only until December 2022 that now companies are required to report to the FDA, not publicly, but report to the FDA when there's a serious adverse health outcome from a beauty or personal care products. What I mean by serious is if someone dies, if a baby is born with a congenital disease, um, if someone is hospitalized. So it's only as of like a year and some change ago that companies even have to report death from these products. So that's how far behind we are. Now there are some really great resources for actually um, looking at your products. I, I don't think I have the internet so I can't put it up. But Cleria, C-L-E-A-R-Y-A, -E is an app that you can use and this is developed by a very close colleague. Um, and you can, if you're, you can actually do shopping at like Sephora, Walmart, through it, and it will tell you what are the toxic chemicals in your products. It will make um, recommendations for safer alternatives. But also, you can use this app and you can scan the ingredients of any product you have. And it will give you a breakdown of every chemical. And it will tell you like, oh, this chemical's banned in the EU and it's like not allowed, but here it is in your lipstick. Or, but so there are tools out there to be able to do um, shopping, but it's 100% on the consumer. Like it's 100% on us, which is really unfortunate and was why we're trying to pass new laws. Uh, yep, clear, yeah, C-L-E-A-R-Y-A, yeah, that's it. And, and the other cool thing is if you use it, we're about to, we're, right now we're working on this, developing a research arm for that so that when um, people are using it, you can like opt in to be a community researcher so that when you're scanning products, ingredient lists, so that we can get the data and analyze them. Is the EU better than the 
Yeah, so it's interesting when it comes to the EU. So the EU has, a, has banned over 2,500 chemicals from cosmetics. The US has banned 11. Um, so yeah, so we're like really bad. But there are some chemicals in cosmetics that are still um, rampantly used, like uh, pigments that tend to contain heavy metals that are used in like lipsticks and such, that the EU still has not banned and we're hoping that they will. Um, so the EU is still not perfect. There are some still toxins in their, um, in their products. Yep, in the back. Are you sure? Okay. Canada is also way better than us too. So if you can get Canadian products easily, they'll be safer. <laughs> Um, so I've noticed a, a large like societal push, uh, which I think is more positive towards like um, curly hair products and things like that that are more embracing of casual curls. And I'm just wondering if there's a, like a correlation to some of this like harmful, um, like as the curly hair products become more po uh, popular, are there similar chemical uh, detriments in those products? Yeah. So this is one thing. This this is another product class that tends to be very problematic. Again, like we pretty consistently see that products that are marketed to women of color tend to be some of the nastiest in terms of their formulation. Um, yeah, so one of the big issues when it comes to curly hair products is endocrine disruptors. So our endocrine system is like our hormonal system and um, there are, there's, Kind of classes of chemicals that are often used in beauty products that are particularly um, I impacting the female reproductive hormones and so we see that these endocrine disruptors tend to be prevalent in um, curly hair products and like um, certain pomades and things like that and so that's something that we're trying to actually expand our work on right now like using actually the Clearia app um, so Sally Beauty Supply, I don't know if any of you, if there's Sally Beauty Supply in Salem, it's like a really common beauty supply store, but they sell a lot of like hair dyes, hair straighteners, curly hair products. So right now we're trying to crawl every product on their website to look at all, are there more endocrine disruptors in those curly hair products marketed towards women of color compared to the products that are marketed more to the general population? Because what we see from like the smaller studies that there tends to be, yeah, more of these endocrine disruptors. And it's really unfortunate because there's no regulation in terms of how companies ad, like advertise. So you can see a product that will say all natural. Like it'll be like all natural, organic, clean, because those things don't have any legal definitions when it comes to cosmetics and beauty products. So they'll stick, plaster that all over. And then if you do an analysis of the ingredients, you're like, oh, there's some endocrine disruptors in here. They're like ingredients derived from fossil fuels. Like you'll see all kinds of, yeah, surprising and toxic things. So do you see a correlation between price of the products, especially like Amazon, it's so much cheaper to buy things on Amazon. Anybody can sell things on Amazon, right? So do you see like a correlation in being targeted for maybe specific audiences, something cheap that would work, right? And if the community is not aware of that, and you tell me like this product here, we might have something. Like I grew up with people just putting from out and their hair, so it's yeah. just a normal thing. Yeah. You just like, and I would go to the salons and my mom just said, just hold your nose. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, and that was it, right? So like, if it says it's cheap and it works, you see a correlation of those products being best sellers uh, compared to others that might be safer, but much more expensive. Yes, surprisingly, there isn't actually a straight correlation with price. And I usually, when I'm giving a tutorial on the um, Clearia app, I always show how I bought this like really expensive Gucci lipstick that I was like, oh, my fancy expensive lipstick. And that if you actually do a chemical analysis, it's like one of the worst lipsticks you could even buy at Sephora. So um, no, actually some of the high-end brands are the worst. And we see that actually also when it comes to um, pollution and climate change in general, like high-end brands like Louis Vuittons and such, they're the ones burning their um, textiles four times a year, being some of the worst pollutants, you know, worst pigments used in clothes and dyes and such. So no, there actually is not that, at least when it comes to like super high-end to kind of mid-end brands. But we don't know, I haven't seen any analysis yet that's looked at, let's say, 
you know, comparison of, um, you know, you can get, let's say a comparison of like a dollar lipsticks to like four or five dollar ones, that kind of thing. Um, but when it comes to like the mid-range stuff and the really high range stuff, no, some of the designer stuff is like the worst. But a part of this is also coming from the fact that it's just, it's just like business as usual. Like there are some toxins that have just been used for so long, for so many decades, that companies just are not wanting to reformulate. So you might have a company that's just been using the same like pigments and you know, um, uh, what is it, uh, preservatives for 50 years in their line and people always loved them and they're not gonna change it. Yeah, so expensive isn't necessarily safer. Oh, yes. Is there a functional reason for why you want endocrine disruptor? No, I don't know in terms of the endocrine disruptors what their purpose is serving. Because there are some, um, you know, there are some things where it's like an obvious reason why you have this toxin. Like some of the pigments, when they're mined, they will have heavy metals. Or like you mine for talc, you can get asbestos. Um, PFAS, which is like the flame retardant, that's used a lot in like anything waterproof. Your waterproof mascara probably has PFAS in it. But that's because it's wicking away the water. Or like if you have lipstick that's like smear proof, it's gonna have PFAS to keep it from smearing. But the endocrine disruptors, I honestly have not found like what is the reason for that or this, you know, because a lot of these things tend to be like mimics, like estrogen mimics and such. And so, yeah, I'm really not sure. But that's a good question. I'll talk to some of my toxicologist colleagues about that. Yeah, because I'm wondering, are they, uh, preservatives? Mm, I don't know. They might be. I mean, so formaldehyde is like the formaldehyde releasers are the main preservative that is found in cosmetics, which is why we're trying to get a formaldehyde ban for cosmetics in New York right now. Um, but yeah, it could be. I'll have That's to check a into lot it. Of disruptors are, um, you know, for mite, keeping the mites numbers down. Oh, I off. see. Yeah, that could be. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yep. They might just be trying to bring fungal levels down. Yeah. Longer. Yep, that definitely could be. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, because there's some things like mercury, used, or mercury actually is still used in eye area cosmetics for um, a, a anti, I think it's like, can't remember which bacteria. There's like one particular bacteria, maybe it's like staph that it's, you know, preventing. So I think a lot of cosmetics are going to have something in there that's like antifungal, some like antibacterial, um, anti, yeah, like Demodex. very. Demodex, eyelash mites. Oh, yeah, that could be. I'm going to definitely look into that. Yeah, cause it is, because they're arthropods. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so then. That's what I think about endocrine disruptors for. Oh, uh, yeah, that's fascinating. So and it definitely could be that there is that functional reason for it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I have one more student. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, I'm going to do this one in the front first. <laughs> okay. We're, just because I have the microphone up here, first we'll go here and then over here. Okay. Um, so, there are like many brands and skincare brands that claim to be clean. Do those, have you actually tested them and have they come back actually clean? Yeah. So it depends on the brand. Some are and some aren't. So um, there are brands that work really hard and have scientists like toxicologists on staff. Like Beauty Counter is one um, brand. Credo Beauty, they sell several clean brands. So they have safe chemical policies that usually are banning, um, you know, banning major chemical classes from their formulations. So you really have to look company by company what their policy is and sometimes you'll still find like you know they've banned some things like um but not others so it's really it's really hit or miss and again because there's no legal definition of clean or non-toxic companies can say that and they can be telling the truth or they could be lying um you mentioned earlier about the road sign pollution is the road sign pollution bad enough that if you were to use a bicycle regularly that would be a problem 
is that a problem around here or in New York? Yeah, so that's an interesting question. So there were there was a study done on this. It's called the bicycle study by my some of my former colleagues at uh, Columbia School of Public Health, where they put air monitors on cyclists that were commuting around New York City. And you know what they ended up finding is like if you're biking or you're running because you're um, inhaling like more air, like higher volume and at a faster rate, you are getting more air pollution for sure. Um, but then the health benefits, because uh, you have to like uh, weigh the costs and benefits. Like the health benefits of doing the cycling, they're saying is probably outweighing like the let's say heart benefits cardiovascular benefits of cycling is going to outweigh the cardiovascular harms from the air pollution but no matter what one of the things that's important is like if you can have mitigating strategies for yourself so if you can take alternative bike routes um, or any routes that separate you from tailpipe emissions in any way. So things like as simple as um, being separated by vegetation. Vegetation is really good at um, kind of grabbing onto particulate matter, and plants can even get up, get air pollutants, the gaseous ones, like into their tissues, like right through their stoma. So you can, people who are running, cycling, and if they're aware of it, you can take actions to try to reduce your exposure. Um, but I think the argument, at least for Americans, is like Americans tend to have pretty sedentary lifestyles. And so we wouldn't want, it would be a public health failure if we told people don't go biking, don't go running because of air pollution, because that would overall have more harms on our health. So thank you very much. Yeah, thanks.